Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for uh, being here. Uh, today we are very happy to listen to Regis Cotreau, who's going to present uh, his work with this uh, student, Martin Colvez. And uh, he will talk about uh, Anderson localization in stratified media. Um, so I let you speak, Regis. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, uh, as Antonin was saying, I'm going to be presenting the work of a PhD student, Marta Colvez, who is uh, about to finish. We'll be looking for a postdoc in uh, not so long a time. Uh, so if you're interested in what I, I'm going to present, please, please acknowledge the fact that it's, it's mainly uh, his work. Okay, so, so what we're going to talk about is elastic uh, wave propagation in uh, random media. And the, the overall setting is, the, is, is that of geophysics. And in particular, uh, when you have a, a, a fault somewhere and then an earthquake occurs, it launches a wave in the medium. So, so, so the, the crust, the earth crust, that's, that's a pretty heterogeneous media, uh, medium. And, and if you look at it on a regional scale, very often it's reasonable, even though it doesn't appear on this sketch here, it's reasonable to model it as a, a horizontally layered medium. Okay, so it's gonna be very heterogeneous, large fluctuations of the mechanical parameters, but mostly horizontal variation. It's logical because of the, the way the earth is created. It's, it's basically a, a gravitational uh, process. So it's pretty logical that on the regional scale, it's, it's more or less uh, horizontal. Okay, so, so we are interested in the fact that it's an earthquake this, this, this sends a wave in this horizontally layered medium and this uh, wave arrives at the surface. Here you have an example of a recording, so very shaky recording. And uh, it impacts, it potentially impacts uh, buildings and sometimes will, will uh, destroy them or impact them in a harmful manner. Now, uh, what we're going to be interested in is, is trying to, to uh, guess what happens, or, or let's say try to understand some features of the wave at the surface, not based on a precise knowledge of all the mechanical parameters and all points on the, on the, on the trajectory of the wave, because that, that's an information we're never going to get. There's no way we're going to know exactly what are the mechanical parameters all along the the trajectory of the waves. So what we'd like to do is uh, that this medium is, is random. Okay, so, so we don't really know what are the values in, in, in each point, but we're just going to, to model it with statistical parameters. So we're going to assume that somehow we're going to be able to uh, image or identify some statistical parameters like correlation length, average value of the mechanical parameters, uh, variance or standard deviation of the of these uh, uh, fluctuation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, what we'd like to do is be able to uh, tell the people that are going to design these buildings to be able to tell them what are going to be the statistics on this wave field at the surface based on statistics of the mechan mechanical parameters. Okay. Uh, so, so we're going to model these mechanical uh, parameters as random field. And what we're going to be interested in a particular regime, which is not the classical homogeneous, homogenization regime. It's, it's, the, it's the homogenization that I'll call here large distance. And that basically states that the wave is going to propagate a long distance. And when I say long, I mean that the distance is going to be long with respect to both the wavelength and this small L here, which uh, will be in the, in, in the case of random fields, uh, correlation length. So basically it's the size, it's the distance over which the mechanical parameters uh, fluctuate um, with order one, okay? So if you consider small distance, then the mechanical parameters are constants with respect to this correlation length. If you consider larger distance with respect to this L, then the, 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 the values of the mechanical parameters are just completely uncorrelated. Okay, now, although I'm saying that this is the regime that interests me, uh, 
a large part of the presentation will be based on something that's more classical, which is, uh, yeah, classical homogenization. That 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 is actually when this size, the the fluctuation size, the the scale of fluctuation, this is small with respect to both lambda and l, which are of the same order magnitude. Okay, so so the, the first part of the presentation will not be on the regime I'm interested in, but rather on a large distance, um, on, a, on a low frequency regime that I'll detail in a minute. Okay, so since I'm, I, I stated that the, this geophysics problem was basically uh, at least the first approximation well modeled using horizontally layered media, I'm gonna simplify heavily my problem and I'm gonna replace all that by uh, uh, this um, uh, model here, where I have a homogeneous medium on the left, and I have a, an incident wave that's going to come from the left, so a plane wave, plane wave coming from the left, that's going to impact a slab that's going to be horizontally layered. Of course, I rotated the image uh, 90 degrees to the right, so uh, the, the, the horizontal direction here is the Z, is the, is the, is the altitude. So my, my wave impacts from the left. The, the, the layering here is uh, parallel to that direction, uh, perpendicular to that direction. And then part of the energy is going to go out from the other side. It's going to be the transmitted wave. And there's also uh, some energy that's going to go back to, to the, the, the side of the incident wave and it's going to be the reflected wave, okay? My slab here is the only heterogeneous thing. So, so both the left half space and that right half space, both of them, are homogeneous, and this one is the heterogeneous one. Uh, and the dependency on the space of the mechanical parameters is only on Z, okay? Only on this uh, direction. And uh, last thing, the slab is of length large L, capital L. Okay, so, so my objective is to compute characteristics of the transmission coefficient. That means I want to have an idea of what happens to this transmitted wave uh, based on statistics of these random parameters here. Now, what we are really interested in is uh, the elasticity case uh, and, and, and the acoustics is already uh, well, well treated. Again, I'm gonna be presenting or recalling much of the result, most of the results in acoustics because that's gonna serve my purpose in terms of, of exposition because as you, as you will see at the end, uh, in the case of elasticity, everything becomes pretty ugly in terms of computation. So even though we are able to get some results, it's very difficult to expose in a seminar like that. Okay, uh, as I said, um, there, most of the, the, the material that I'm gonna present here is actually known, uh, although it's not necessarily under that form. And uh, hopefully uh, the point of view that I'm presenting is still interesting and shows you how to go for, for the elasticity case, which is not uh, known. Okay, so what do we do classically in elastic waves in horizontally uh, layered media? It, the first thing we can do is decouple a little bit the problem. Now in, in, in elasticity, you have, uh, so the unknown, the displacement field is vectorial. So that means you actually have in a homogeneous case, three waves that propagate and not just one. So if the, the, the blue arrow here is the direction of propagation of your, of your, your wave, and uh, the yellow, the yellow uh, plane is the, the interface between two media. When, when your wave uh, propagates, what you have uh, is that, so, so the first thing is that the, the, the polarization, if we look at polarization of the, of, the, of the waves, of course the P wave is polarized along the direction of propagation. Now, the question is, Besides this P wave, you have also two shear waves, S waves. And these, the polarization of these is, is more complex because we only know it's perpendicular to this direction of propagation. Okay, so basically we could choose any basis uh, for the, the two dimensional wave. Uh, we could choose any basis orthogonal to this um, direction of propagation. Now we always choose one particular one, which is the one that's plotted here, where we first choose what we're going to call the SH polarization. And that polarization, we choose it in a unique way uh, as perpendicular to this direction of propagation and within the horizontal surface, which is the, the orthogonal, if you want, to the direction of fluctuation of the parameters. Now, if we do this, of course, this defines also 
the what we call the SV wave, the vertical wave, although it's not really vertical. This one's horizontal, but this one's not really vertical because it's still uh, orthogonal to the direction of propagation. And the, the nice thing, uh, if we do this, is then the SH wave is orthogonal to the direction of uh, fluctuation of the parameters. And so we can uncouple it from the other two directions. Now, the, oops, the P wave and the SV wave are still coupled, but the SH wave is uncoupled. So this is stated here, uh, where I've chosen the first order um, form of the, of the wave equation. So my, I have the velocity for each of the modes, I have a velocity and a stress. Now in more detail, the, the operator that relates the derivative in space, and here I've, I've chosen to, to use Fourier transform in time and the, the first order derivative in time, what relates these, uh, these two is um, uh, an operator matrix here that has this form in uh, for the SH wave and this form for the, uh, the elastic wave. Now, let me note here that I've also used the Fourier transform in the X variable. And I'm, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm considering the X is this direction here, uh, orthogonal to the SH. Um, so the K here is not really the wave number. This one's the slowness. So it's, it's basically the horizontal wave number the, it's the horizontal slowness, the horizontal wave number divided by the, the frequency. Uh, okay, now one hypothesis that I'll be doing consistently in this talk is a first order uh, approximation in the wave number. So basically that means I'm considering that the, the, there is, it's almost normal incidence. So my plane wave impacting the slab is going to impact that slab almost at 90 degree, okay? So I can have small deviations from the 90 degree, the, the normal incidence. Okay, um, what else? Here, the parameters that are chosen to use for the parameterization is the density, the shear modulus, and also the P wave modulus. The, um, the velocities of the P and S waves are just the square root of respectively kappa and mu divided by rho. And I'm going to need, I need here for the parameterization, the ratio of the velocity and I consider CS over CP. Okay, now uh, this was just a general setting and then I'm gonna be uh, trying to, to go for my uh, aim. Okay, the first thing I'm gonna be considering is the effective properties of finely layered slab. What I mean here is I'm gonna be interested in low frequency homogenization. Uh, that is the only thing that's gonna be small is the, the scale of fluctuation of the property. So my properties fluctuate very rapidly with respect to both the wavelength and the distance of propagation. Now, the reason I do, I'm studying this case before the one I'm interested in re really, which is long distance. The reason why I do this is because it allows to introduce a little bit the, the way I'm gonna be tackling the problem and it introduces it a little bit easier. Okay, so let me consider first the SH case, which is of course simpler because you saw the equations are, are much more sim much simpler. So I uh, this is again the, the case I was uh, I decided to consider. Um, now to enter in more details, this is the parameters I'm going to be considering. So basically, what this um, what these formulas say is that on the left and on the right, I'm going to consider a homogeneous medium. So no fluctuation of the parameters of the mechanical parameters. So both on the left and on the right, I have uh, this overline rho and overline mu. And I'm going to give the values of these rho and mu of the overline values uh, a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, it'll, it'll come naturally. But the idea is that these values are gonna be homogenized values and I'll define that uh, corresponding to these fluctuations of the property. Okay, now I also introduced the small scale fluctuation. And the idea here is that these rho and mu are gonna be, uh, be random fields. And this L, I'm going to make it become very small with respect to the, the, the scale of the slab. Uh, okay. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do is starting from this system, I'm going to decide as is very classical, I'm gonna to decide to look at, uh, at trying to solve the system, not in using these uh, variables, but uh, different kind of variables, which are the uh, right going and left going uh, modes 
in that uh, in the homogeneous medium. Now, of course, this is very natural in the homogeneous case, but I'm also going to project along the same mode within the heterogeneous slab. Okay, so that's a little bit less natural. So the transformation of, of the unknowns is the following. Uh, what's important is what we get here in the end in, in the rotated, um, uh, for the rotated variables. Now, if we did that transformation for an actual homogeneous medium, now this would just give uh, one minus one here. Okay, so the delta plus and delta, mu, uh, delta minus I've defined are the following. Now, of course, if the actual density of the slab was overlying rho, this would be one. And if the, uh, the, the actual uh, uh, shear modulus of the slab was overlying mu, this would be one. And of course, delta minus would be zero and delta plus would be one. Okay, so in, in the homogeneous case, which is what happens for the half spaces, uh, of course, this matrix in the center would be one, one, and zero on the extra diagonal, which means that the left and right going wa uh, waves are in couple, which is the, what we expect in the homogeneous medium. Now, the fact that we are considering these modes uh, that are not really the ones of the, of the slab means that there's a coupling between left and right going uh, modes dependent on Z. Okay. Now, the second transformation we're going to do is, is instead of following these amplitudes of these left and right going modes in a fixed frame, let's say ZT, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow these modes along their movement. Okay, so I'm going to do this kind of transformation. S here is a time. So I'm going to follow the amplitude of that mode in, in a, along its movement. Again, when, I, when I'm saying I'm gonna follow along its movement, I'm, I'm actually thinking behind that I'm, I'm in a homogeneous medium with the right properties, which is not the case for the slab. Okay, but that, that's the I am gonna try, try to follow. Now, if I do this change of variable, this change of frame, uh, I can take Fourier space in time and, uh, or in the new variable, and that's what I'm going to get. Uh, here, this derivative, uh, in, if I take the derivative in space, I'm sorry, here, this derivative in space is going to uh, transport to both variables. Um, and if I use these equation, once I've done the, the, the partial derivatives for each variable, then I just get uh, a relation in terms of the Fourier transform, okay? So this modifies a little bit these equations by putting these ones here. Uh, okay, now again, uh, if I was in the homogeneous medium, what would I get? Now this delta mu is still one and these delta minus would be zero. So, so this matrix in the case of homogeneous medium, what is, it, what is it? It's zero, 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 zero. What it means is that these modes in the, in the, in the frame where we follow the, the, the modes, it's just, there's no evolution. Again, that's the expected behavior in a homogeneous medium where, where in a non-dispersive medium, uh, at least, where the, the waves just are not modified through their, their, their propagation. Okay, now, now uh, there's a last little manipulation we, we need to do. Now, if you remember the setting here, what I said is I have a, an incident wave uh, that I'm, I'm gonna say that the amplitude of that wave is gonna be one. Uh, I'm interested in the transmitted wave and the reflected wave. And of course here, I didn't state that I had a wave coming from the right to impact the slab from the right. And, and of, that means my setting, I choose zero. Okay, so, so the boundary conditions in my problem are that the left going wave, the, the right going wave on the left of my slab is one, that's the incoming wave, the, the, yeah, the incoming wave. I have no wave propagating to the left from the right of my slab. So that's, I assuming that's zero. And, and the, the, the questions, the, the solution of my problem, what I'm interested in is the left going wave on the, on the left of my slab, that's the reflected wave. And I'm interested in the right going wave on the right of the slab. And that's the, the transmitted wave. Okay, so I'm going to reformulate a little bit this system here. I'm going to reformulate it because the, the issue here is I'm interested in this quantity in zero and L, but in a crossed way. Okay, I know that this in zero, I know this in L, 
and I'm interested in this in zero and this in L. So, so that's boundary value problem. It's a bit complicated to solve. So I'm going to transform that into initial value problem where I know everything on zero and I propagate to L. But if I want to do this, I need to transform my, my system that was given for only two unknowns. I'm going to transform that into a, a two by two unknowns. So I, I introduced this propagator again. So that's a pretty classical technique. I'm going to assume that this propagator is a vector, two by two, I'm sorry, a matrix, two by two matrix. The value of the propagator for z equals zero is just the identity. And when I'm going to assume that this propagator verifies the same equation as, as my origin, original uh, variable a, b. Now you can verify that if you have this, if you solve p, okay, if you solve the p as, as this, now if you, uh, introduce on the left a, b at zero, this p is going to give you exactly a and b and z. Okay, now this, is, this, this comes from the fact that you can multiply the system here by a, b and zero and the right and the left. And of course the a, b and zero does not depend on z. So you can put it inside. And then this, you recognize that this p times a and, z, a and b and zero is exactly the uh, unknown you had uh, earlier. Okay, so we're going to solve the same equation before a matrix unknown, and that, that will allow us on post processing to get the quantities that we're interested in just by solving this little two by two system. Okay, now uh, this reformulation is fine. And, and now the question that we have is what happens to this problem when the fast variable, okay, here I have this Z variable. How does it depend, uh, how does it uh, uh, evolve? What does it become when the fast variable becomes very small? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to introduce an averaging theor theorem. Uh, now, I just wanna state that all this is a little bit Overcomplicated. These are things that can be uh, done much simpler. The way I, the, the, I, I chose to introduce it this way because I'm going to use that again. All this uh, uh, technicity, I'm going to use it again in the second part of the talk to get results that cannot be obtained in simpler uh, forms. Okay. So, so if you consider that you have an equation dx over dz equals something. Now this, this, the hypothesis I'm gonna be putting on F besides some continuity that I'm, that I'm not going to detail here. Uh, the thing is I'm gonna say that this F depends on my variable, but it does not depend on it. Uh, it cannot increase faster than linearly. Okay, so it's not some constant times a square, uh, x square. Okay, so dx over dz equal to something that does not increase faster than linearly in x. Okay, so that's the first thing, the, the main hypothesis, let's say. And the second hypothesis I have here is the fact that the fast fluctuation, so, so this F also depends on some random field, uh, some random process here. And, and the, the main hypothesis is that this, the small parameter is only, only enters the problem through this random field. Okay, so in particular, I don't have a small parameter in the dependence, space dependence of the variable, neither in the direct variable. Now, of course, here, if you come back to this equation here, you see that the, my z here, I have a periodicity in z, okay, of the operator f. I, I'm, I'm sorry, the, my f is hp, okay, and here my variable, what's x on this next slide is this p here, okay, so hp, it is linear in that case. So, could go for a more complicated case with the same theorem. But in my specific case, here I'm exactly linear in x or in p. Now, if we look at what's inside this uh, linearity coefficient or matrix, there is a dependency on z, but it's small, um, slowly fluctuating z. There's no epsilon in here, and now the epsilon only comes through this z prime here, or the small fluctuate, the small uh, dimensions only comes here. So it's only through these deltas that are exactly. Uh, the fluctuation of the parameters, mechanical parameters that are the random field. Okay, so here in my case, I'm exactly linear in F, in uh, X, and the fluctuation, the, the, the fast scale only comes through the random field, through the, the mechanical parameters. Okay, and if you have this setting and, and your, your 
in zero, x is equal to some given quantity. Now, if you have this, then you can uh, show that the this x converges, which is a priori, it's random because y is random. Now, this x is going to converge for a small scale of fluctuations of the parameters is going to converge to an x bar or overline x, which is the solution of a deterministic differential equation. So this f here was random through y, and now this, this randomness disappears in the limit. And I obtain a x bar, which is a perfectly deterministic quantity solution of a deterministic differential equation. And the way this f bar, this deterministic f is computed from f is just basically the average. Okay, so it's it's either the average in space or the average in uh, in the random uh, dimension. Um, yeah. Okay, now I'm just going to give a little indication of the proof, not really for itself, uh, but because it it will show us why I was saying that this is not a long distance uh, theorem. Now, if we if we try to bound this x minus x bar, so basically I'm I'm stating that x is going to converge to x bar, so that means this quantity in some sense has to go to zero. Now, if I write this, of course, uh, what I know is is dx over dz. So so this x formally is just a formal proof. Huh? This this f is the this x is the integral of f, and the x bar is just the integral of f bar. Now I'm going to add and remove of that uh, two terms equation. I'm gonna add and remove this quantity here. Okay, so here I, I have f with x and here I have f bar with x bar and I'm gonna add and remove this f with x bar. Okay, so of course, if I take it out, I, I do a minus here, I have to add a plus, uh, I'm sorry, to add a plus, yeah, here. Yeah, it looks like there's a mistake here. No, it's a plus, that's fine. So I have a minus f of x bar and here I have a plus of f of x bar. So let, let's let's first bound this basically because I assume that f is less, is increasing less than linearly in uh, x. That allows me to say that this uh, x minus x bar is possibly with a constant, is inferior, is lower than this integral of x minus x bar. Okay, so this f here, norm of the x, f minus f bar, no, I'm sorry, this one, f of x minus f of x bar, it's lower, it's less than linear with respect to this x minus x bar. Okay, and the second thing I can say is that uh, uh, here what I have, f of x bar and f bar of x bar, what I have is, is just the integral, okay? so. When this integral goes to infinity, this quantity here, because f is ergodic, is going to go to its to its average. Okay, so this quantity here basically is going to zero when I'm considering a small scale that goes to zero. Okay, so what I really have here is that this is oops uh, is smaller than this. Now I can have a more precise statement, which says that using uh, Gronwell's lemma that tells you that if z is inferior to a constant plus a constant uh, integral of z, then that means that z is bounded by the first constant exponential, the second constant times t, okay? And this is exactly what, what I have. This is my c1, this is my c2 here. So that means I can bound uh, this x minus x bar by something that's a constant g and this constant goes to zero at large distance exponential c2 of t. Now the issue here is that this constant c2 is not zero. And if you take this, this t to a large time, if you, if you increase t, that means this quantity might be able to compensate for this g. I'm saying g is going to zero, but really if time is large, maybe this g doesn't go to zero fast enough, okay? So all this I've been uh, talking about right now is only true if you consider small times. Okay, what happens is larger times is that, uh, and, and basically it tells you that, 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 that in that case, what you get is just the homogeneous behavior. Now we're gonna now choose something. We're gonna choose the, the value of the rho hat, um, I'm sorry, uh, rho bar and, and mu bar. We're gonna choose them to be this quantity. Now, the reason we do this is because that's what we need in order to 
um, uh, to state that the average, the ensemble average of delta plus is one and the ensemble average of delta minus is one because that means the ensemble average of this H here is going to be zero. Uh, so, so, so what we're choosing here is exactly the classical definition of the homogenized parameters for the density and the shear modulus uh, in order to obtain that the low frequency or low uh, short distance propagation is going to be the propagation of a wave in a homogeneous medium and a homogenized medium. Okay, so basically all this, what it states is that if we consider this rho bar and mu bar in that way, then my uh, limit system is going to be this one, which is, as I exposed earlier, the system we have for a homogeneous, for a wave in a homogeneous medium. Okay, so all this I've been saying until now is just to say that if the, 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 the parameters fluctuate very rapidly and the density uh, I mean, if the, if the density and the parameters, the shear parameter fluctuate very rapidly with respect to wavelength, then uh, the medium is not going to see the heterogeneity except in an average manner. Okay, so here I, I have two examples taken from uh, the book of Fook. So uh, I'm coming back. So here is time on the left axis. Here on the horizontal axis is the Z. So, so at time zero, what I have is I have a, a pulse in my left, uh, in, uh, to the left of my random media, the slab is here. So the, income, the, the, yeah, the, the, the incoming wave comes from, from the left. It goes into the, the slab. And here I have considered the medium, the, it's a constant by parts and, and the, the scale of fluctuation is not really small. It's not small with respect to lambda. So what you have first is that you have a reflected wave when the, the incoming pulse arrive. And in the, in the middle, you see that there are lots of things happening. And then finally you have a transmitted signal. Now, if you decrease the scale of fluctuation so that the, 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 the medium oscillates very rapidly with respect to lambda, then you start seeing that this resembles uh, just a pulse propagating in a homogeneous medium and if you choose the half spaces with the with the bar as the the same value as the homogeneous or corresponding to the homogenized version of this uh, heterogeneous slab, then you have no reflection here, and uh, you really don't see the slab. Okay, again, this is only true when the wavelength is of the order of the magnitude of the of the of the slab, because even though it looks like it's almost homogeneous wave, what happens is you can see that there's still some there's still some energy that gets reflected. Now, even though it doesn't build up to something that's very important, this lost energy somehow is going to show, if you propagate long distance, it's going to show in the transmitted signal and you're gonna have an apparent damping of that transmitted signal just through the small, 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 small uh, succession of, uh, of losses with, uh, after each heterogeneity. Okay. Now, what happens in the PSV case? Well, um, the, the short answer is the same thing happens, but it's a little bit more complex. Now, what is more complex here is the, is the fact that if you propagate an elastic wave in a horizontally layered medium, uh, you, you get you, you, the homogenized version, let's say the homogenized, the, the homogenized medium corresponding to this uh, horizontally layered medium is not is isotropic. Okay, so even though you consider isotropic layers, so in each in the slab the medium is heterogeneous and isotropic, and isotropic, the wave in the fast fluctuations regime, the 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 wave is going to look like or or to to behave as a an isotropic. Okay, and that's the layering creating this anisotropy. Okay, so, so I'm gonna do basically the same thing as in the acoustics case, but, or SH case, but I'm gonna have to introduce that in the two half space, the left and right half space, I'm gonna need to have a, an anisotropic media in order for everything to work. Okay, so the way I introduce it is, is the following. This is the equation of my slab. Uh, of course, in the homogeneous case, I have exactly the same except these quantities here are going to be, the, the mechanical parameters are going to be homogeneous. And 
there's going to be small differences because it's going to be an isotropic medium. Okay, so this is really for this lab. Uh, and, and, and for this anisotropy, I'm going to have to introduce another parameter that, that are called delta, and we'll, we'll see later on how it comes in. Okay, and besides the delta in this lab, I don't have any delta in this lab, and in this lab it's isotropic, so I have density, uh, P wave parameter, and shear wave parameter, shear modules. Okay, now, because I have four variables, uh, okay, the Vx, sigma xz, vz, and sigma zz, I'm gonna have two waves that propagate in this medium, the P wave and the S wave, and so I'm gonna do a slightly more complex change of variable to, to transform into the, the, so I have the right going and left going P waves and the right going and, and left going SV waves. Okay, and I can still do, do this transformation and, and this is the system I obtain. So the first order, again, remember I have a, I'm, I'm, I'm small, I'm considering small angles. Now for K equals zero, what I, what I get is really here a two by two system for the SV waves, okay? Uh, this one gives me uh, the SV waves completely uncoupled from the P waves. Okay, that's the, the classical thing. If you have normal incidence, then both the, the SH and the SV are in the, in the plane of, uh, of the interfaces and, and so every, everybody decouples. Okay, now more interesting is the, the first order in K term and what we have in these first order in term uh, first order term is that it's only the 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 sv is going to be coupled to the p but there's no additional first order term coupling the sv with sv okay it's it's to first order it's only sv coupled to ap or, or p coupled to sv but there's no uh, self term okay i have the this quantity here i had already introduced now i have the same so, so I called, oh, I'm sorry, it's going to be delta mu and delta kappa in, in the following presentation. Sorry if I made the mistake. So this one I already introduced. Again, remember that in a homogeneous medium, isotropic, this would be one and this would be one. We have the same quantity for kappa. Again, this would be one in a homogeneous medium and one here. And we have an additional quantity and that's where delta comes into play. Uh, it's a little bit messy, so I'm not going to talk about it too much, but basically what is fluctuating with Z here is this ratio, these two quantities that are the one above. And there's also an additional term that comes into play, which is uh, alpha square. So alpha square, basically it's the, uh, it's mu over kappa. Okay, so basically when I go for averages, I'm not going to have only average of rho, average of mu and average, of, uh, I'm sorry, average of one over mu and average of one over kappa. I'm also going to have average of mu, mu over kappa. Okay, so that's the additional degrees of freedom if you want to see it that way, then that means that the homogeneous version of the elasticity, it's not going to be just two acoustics case, two mono wave cases, but I'm really going to create some coupling between the two and that's where the anisotropy is going to come from. Now, the way I'm going to define this delta bar in the end, it's in order to cancel this delta here on average. Okay, and that's, that's the definition, that, that's the classical definition that Bacchus uh, derived in 1962, even though he didn't absolutely do it that way. Um, okay, so now I have my equation in the rotate, I mean, in, in the following the waves. Now I'm going to, to do another thing uh, as before, I'm going to consider change of time, uh, change of uh, follow the, the waves in their movement. So of course the SV waves move with a velocity CS while the, uh, the P wave move with a velocity P. Okay, so that creates, when I change the variable that creates a much richer behavior. And in particular to first order, again, it's just the, the same as the acoustics case, the waves are decoupled to first two order zero, but at first order, I get very, uh, I get fancier behavior. And in particular here, I have these delta C and delta P, uh, plus that uh, uh, can give me in particular when it's a minus here, if I have CP and CS that are close by, this quantity is gonna be very big and we can expect to see interesting uh, behaviors here. Okay, now, as I was already mentioning, I'm gonna consider the same averages before plus something that's related to mu over kappa. 
that allows me on average to cancel all these uh, quantity except the those. And in the end, I just get that dp over dz using the, the, the propagator uh, variable. dp over dz is going to be zero with the first um, the value in z equals zero, which is the identity. And that's again, uncoupled with propagation in homogeneous media. Okay, uh, now let's go to the more interesting part, which is what happens at long distance. Now I'm gonna do this, uh, try to motivate this a little bit and explain what's difficult at long distance in that, in that manner. Now, what I did here, it's a 3D propagation. You're just seeing a slice. And I just put an explosion or whatever boundary condition in the, beginning, in the beginning and see how the wave propagates. Now, what happens uh, in the previous example I showed, you could see that the wave really behaved deterministically. There were no fluctuations, very small scale fluctuations at the end, but it propagated just like in a homogeneous media. Now, in this case here, if you go long distance here, the wavelength is very small here. Uh, it's very expensive computation. So, so, so really, you see the fluctuations. If you, if you look at different directions of propagation, which is a little bit like considering different realization of the medium, now you don't really have any homogeneity, right? The wave, and in particular its phase, is completely random. So what does this mean? It means that if you're looking for a homogenized equation for you, you really have no chance to get it. It doesn't look like it comes out of the, uh, just solving the, 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 the wave equation. But on the other hand, if you look at, you, you kind of wink the eyes and you look at what happens uh, if you blur everything a little bit, now you see that you, you actually observe th something that's pretty isotropic that seems to be more or less the same in every direction. So that means that, that what we have to do is not really look for the displacement field, uh, but really for uh, quadratic quantities or uh, energy uh, quantities related to that. And here I show it in a maybe clearer way. Uh, if, you, if you look at wave propagation in a, a random medium and you plot the energy density for different, so, so, so this is what you get, the, 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 the wiggly curve is what you get uh, considering the, the wave equation in random medium. And you can actually show that this behaves as a diffusion equation, okay? So, so, so in the beginning, it's not the same, but after uh, some distance, then the, the non-wiggly equation, the non-wiggly curve, which is the solution of a diffusion equation with constant coefficient, non-random non, non equation, uh, this gives more or less the same result. Okay, so that's, that's really what we have to do. So what I wanna stress here is that when I'm gonna go long distance, even though I consider small parameters, my solution is still going to be random. Okay, and I'm gonna show that. However, if you look at the right quantities of interest, and in particular, I'm going to look at the amplitude squared or the amplitude, if you want, of the, of the transmission coefficient, then I have a chance to get something that is deterministic, okay? So that's very different from the first case I've been showing where in the limit, everything was deterministic. There was no randomness anymore. In that case here, I'm going to have randomness at the end. Okay. So let's start with SH wave. Now, of course, I'm gonna go much faster now because uh, everything has already been intro introduced. Now, the, 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 the weak scattering regime that I'm gonna consider is small fluctuations and this regime. So lambda, the wavelength is gonna be of the same order magnitude as the scale of fluctuations, the parameters, and both of them are gonna be small. Now, if I try to uh, do a scaling, that means here the epsilon, so that's this, no, first, I'm sorry. I'm gonna consider one over mu to be this on the outer slabs, uh, outer half spaces. And in the slab for Z in zero and L, I'm gonna model it that way. So one over mu is of course the same as the outside. One plus a random field, random process that's gonna be uh, centered. And I'm gonna scale its standard deviation to be epsilon. Okay, epsilon, of course, in the end, it's gonna be a small quantity. And I'm gonna make the scale of fluctuation fluctuate with epsilon square. Okay, so now it's be very, very fast with respect. Of course, L is assumed to be order one. So that means this is going to be very, very fast with respect to the length of propagation. And because I want lambda to be of the same order as the scale of fluctuation, I'm also going to rescale the frequency with epsilon square. So that means lambda is gonna be the same order and both are gonna be small with respect to L. 
Okay. Now, if I do exactly the same thing, same thing as before, there was no hypothesis in the beginning. I can just directly start from this equation. Now, what changes here is I have omega divided by epsilon square. So everywhere I had an omega and I have to scale by epsilon square. And in my parenthesis here, I have a z over epsilon square. And also, because I chose particular values for rho and mu, uh, now I have a particular value for delta plus and minus. Okay, and in particular, I get this. So that means delta minus is just scales with epsilon nu, and one minus delta plus scales also with epsilon nu. So I have an epsilon nu, nu divided by epsilon square. So in the end, I have a square, um, I'm sorry, I have a one over epsilon in front of my, uh, my matrix, and the nu here is in factor of everything. Okay, now I, I'm going to reuse the propagator uh, technique. And my new system here, if I just emphasize on the, on, the, on the epsilons, I have a factor one over epsilon in front of H. And in the middle, I have Z over epsilon square in the exponentials. And I have Z over epsilon square in nu. Okay, so, so I can really not use the same averaging theorem as before, because uh, here I have a fast fluctuation. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce a different uh, averaging theorem, which I'm not going to, to, to discuss uh, in detail, but the proof is uh, in, this, in this book. Uh, now, it, it's basically the same kind of thing. The, the only important thing is here that the limit process, the limit solution x epsilon, it goes to an x bar or x in the limit. Now this limit process is not going to be deterministic. Okay, so I have to characterize this process as a uh, random process. So uh, without entering in the details, basically I'm gonna characterize this process with uh, as a Markov diffusion process. So, so this, this quantity, let, let's not go into details. What's important is that I'm gonna have these quantities. And of course, it's here, this F in my case is H, H, P. So I'm gonna have correlation between H and this gradient here is with respect to the, to the degrees of freedom of X. And so the, the, basically I'm gonna have correlation between H and itself, okay? And, uh, and I'm going to have integrals over the, 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 the phase and integrals over the distance, okay? Now, again, not going into too much detail, what it means is that I'm going to have these quantities that are going to come into play. This gamma, which is just the correlation or the spectrum rather, the spectrum of nu, the, this uh, fluctuation parameter for the, for, the, for the shear modulus, and also have, uh, so this is not exactly the, or it's the imaginary part of the, of the 4 one Okay, so basically these are correlation of, uh, of the shear modules. Okay, now this is uh, more technically the limit process, the limit diffusion process. You can write it as a stochastic differential equation. So either in Stratonovich or Ito form. Uh, Let's look at the second form if you want. What it says is that if you look not at dp, but at the average of dp, what it tells you is, is you can characterize it here only with the trig. But if you do this, it's not gonna be very interesting. What's gonna be interesting is if you, instead of looking at dp, you look at d of the transmission coefficient squared, then you get something that converges um, uh, to um, a limit that's uh, uh, feasible. So if you remember, we said that, I'm sorry, the, the, the propagator equation, what it did is it's related the, what was happening at z equals zero to what was happening at z equal L, the propagate in, in L. So if I have incident wave from the left and nothing from the right, that means I have a one here and zero and a zero here. And the left propagating on the left is what we call the reflection coefficient and the right propagating on the right slab on the right half space is the transmission coefficient. Here I have the values in zero and he, oops, and here I have the values in L. Now, if I use th this characterization, uh, stochastic characterization of the of the of these propagator matrix plus this, and I don't look at T itself, but I look at the norm of T squared. And again, the reason for doing that is, is what I was uh, discussing earlier. Then you get something that's still stochastic. Here, this is a standard Brownian motion. 
But to first order in L, or at lower order in L, this is going to be the leading. Uh, the reason with that is that in the limit, the Brownian motion divided by L is going to converge to zero. Okay, so, so really this, this one is the leading order in L, this linear in L. And so in the limits, basically what it tells you is that the, the transmission coefficient is going to decrease uh, exponentially in L with a characteristic distance that we call the, the localization distance, which is this quantity here. So it relates to the correlation that I introduced earlier. It relates to the average value of CS, of course. And in the correlation, I also have, uh, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, now, the, this exponential decay of the amplitude, it's what characterizes uh, Anderson, so-called Anderson localization. Now, we tried to reproduce this. Uh, for now, it's not perfectly uh, good, but I'm still going to show it. Uh, we try to reproduce it numerically. Now, we're using a, a 3D simulation because we wanted to do more complicated things later, so we just started with this. Uh, it's more complicated than expected. Uh, this is a pretty expensive simulation because we're doing 3D. Of course, here we could be doing uh, 1D, as I showed earlier. Uh, but if we want to do inclination, then we need to go at least for 2D. Uh, here you have the parameters, it's not very important. Uh, I'm going to show a little movie. So you have the plane wave on the left, it starts propagating. We have issues here. We, we use PMLs, but they're not perfectly uh, working. Actually, in a slab, you don't see much. Sometimes you see a little reflection, but it's because each of the reflection is small, okay? Now, uh, if I look to the more interesting thing, which is the spectrum, as I showed earlier, I'm expecting that this quantity here, the transmitted coefficient is going to uh, go to the zero, but as a length dependent, with the length dependent parameter that depends on the frequency, okay? So it's going to be different for each frequency range. What I plot here is the correlation length as a function of omega, okay, or the frequency. And, um, and here I compare with the, the with 5,000 meters, five kilometers, which is the actual length of the, the slab. Okay, so basically when both of them become of the same order of magnitude, then I expect localization to take place. Now it's actually, uh, uh, the quantities are not quantitative, but the, the numbers are not uh, perfectly hit, but we do see that between correlation length of 80 meters here and 40 meters, we see that there's more localization in, the case, in this case. Okay, let me just in two minutes because I'm very late. Try to do the try to state what we are obtaining for elastic case. Uh, in the elastic case, I do exactly the same. Now uh, the only thing is I, I I'm, I'm assuming that the density here is constant, but I still have two random parameters, so I have two uh, nu's nu k nu kappa and nu mu. Uh, the scaling is the, are the same. I I get as before the same kind of quantities. Again, the delta c minus and delta c plus we could expect that they're gonna give interesting phenomena. And now solving the system is much, much, much more complicated than the previous case. Now, the hypothesis that we, or the way we started to go was to uh, expand the solution here also in small angles. Now, if you do this, this allows you to decouple the, the system in, in, in smaller subsystems, uh, but the solution of, so, so we do obtain a ETO form of the, Propagator matrix. Now I'm showing this shark instead of showing the equations because the shark is much nicer. Um, now the the where we're kind of stuck now. So so this we've managed to obtain, and where we're kind of stuck now, but we are we going forward, is that in these uh, 4D case, the the definition of transmission and reflection coefficients is more complex. Now, for example, if you consider an incoming SV wave, that means there is no incoming P wave, and you assume that no P wave or S wave are coming from the right, uh, you still have four uh, transmission and reflections instead of two, and they're all coupled. Okay, so it's a little bit more complex to, to study in terms of uh, stochastic differential equations, and we're, we're looking at it. And, and then the, the, the last thing that, I mean, the, the real thing that we want to look at once we're, we're going to be able to finalize this is we want to look at what happens when. CP is a multiple of CS uh, because in that case, you may expect 
and these delta C plus to see things. Okay, so so when we compute the correlation for the stochastic, the, the limit stochastic differential equation, when we compute the correlation, basically uh, all these exponential, they kind of decouple uh, among themselves. Now, in the case that we, uh, that this delta plus is a, multi, uh, the CS are a multiple of CP, we may expect that some uh, phase may take place. So we want to look at that. And the other thing is we want to look at is what, what happens when CS goes to CP, because even though it cannot be equal, uh, when it goes to CP, because in that case, we're going to have a delta C minus that's going to go to zero. And then eventually the exponential might become uh, much more stable or, or to longer distances. And, uh, and that's about it. I thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for being a little bit uh, too long and uh, I'll welcome your questions.